Good morning, everyone. The study of mathematics, like the Nile, begins in minuteness but ends in magnificence, says Charles Caleb Colton. On behalf of the Department of Mathematics, Holy Cross College, Autonomous Nagarkoil, I, Sister Antin Mary, extend a very warm welcome for the state level webinar on distances and algorithms in graphs. Let me offer a special welcome to our Vice Principal, Dr. Sister Lima Rose, to eminent resource persons, Dr. Titus, Head of the Department of Science and Humanities, University College of Engineering, Nagarkoil, and Dr. Andrew Kinsley, Associate Professor, St. Xavier's Autonomous College, Palenkote. My warm welcome extends to Dr. Aril Flower, Head of the Department of Mathematics, motivating force behind all the department activities. I extend a warm welcome to the faculty members and students of our college and the other colleges wish you moments of awakening and learning. Go down deep enough into anything and you will find mathematics, says Dean Skeletter. We shall begin our webinar with the blessings of the Almighty as we prayerfully listen to this hymn. Me. invite Dr. Arun Fla, the head of the Department of Mathematics, a person of vibrance, leadership and meticulous planning to give the welcome address. Good morning to all. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone for our department webinar today. First, I extend a warm welcome to our loving Vice Principal, Dr. Sister Lima. The first thing which flashes across the mind is the courage, concern, and love she has for the poor, sick, and needy. In the midst of the terrible second wave of COVID-19, we saw her distributing food packets in the government hospital. That needs courage, concern, and love, and it speaks a lot about her. We should learn from her, and I feel proud and happy to welcome her in our midst today. Welcome, sister. Dr. Titus is a well-known researcher in graph theory 
At present, he is working as assistant professor of mathematics in the University College of Engineering, Nagpur. He has the history of being the best student of mathematics in college and has received the Venus International Research Award for 2017. He has produced four PhDs at the same age and is guiding eight scholars at present. He has written five books and has published 54 papers in international and four in national journals. He also has a DSC project to his credit. He has been the member of different committees in the university level, such as teaching fellow interview team, affiliation inspection team, academic audit team, advisory committee, selection committee for research supervisors, selection committee for scholars, selection committee for teacher fellowship, squad member of Anna University examinations, and external expert of PhD Viva Rossi examinations. He has served in various capacities, such as Deputy Controller of Examinations of Anna University of Technology, Tirnalveli, Head of the Department of Mathematics, University College of Engineering, Tirnalveli, Head of the Department of Mathematics, University College of Engineering, Nagarpoil, and Chairman of the Mathematics Board of Anna University Valuation. He has also served as the Board of Studies member of various colleges like Anna University, Chennai, Anna University of Technology, Tirnalveli, St. Xavier's College, Palempote, Rural Islam College and Medco Slunk Engineering College, Shivagati. As a person, he is sincere and honest, who is also very helpful to his financially poor students. On behalf of myself and everyone present here, I accord to you, sir, a very warm welcome. Thank you, ma'am. A warm welcome to Dr. Andrew Kinsley, too, who is the resource person for the second session. I also welcome the faculty and students from other institutions and my own colleagues and students. Welcome one and all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your warm words of welcome. May I now request Dr. Sister Lima Rose, our vice principal and assistant professor of botany, a person with far-sighted vision and practical sense, to felicitate the event. Honorable Secretary and Principal, renowned resource persons Dr. Titus and Dr. Anthony Kingsley, Anto Kingsley, Convener and Head of the Department of Mathematics Dr. Arulflar Mary, Organizing Secretaries Dr. Magila and Dr. Sister Antin Mary, respected professors, scholars and students, a pleasant good morning to all. I am profusely elated to take this opportunity to offer my felicitation for the state-level webinar on distances and algorithms in graphs. To motivate others, we need to inspire by our commitment, competence, and hard work. Yes, dear participants, the Department of Mathematics always aspires to reach high. For that, they work hard, spend time and energy, and achieve success everywhere. I appreciate Dr. Arufla Mary for the encouragement and the support provided to the staff and students to reach their goal. I do appreciate the organizing secretaries, Dr. Magila and Dr. Sister Antin Mary, for their interest and enthusiasm in providing excellent knowledge to the students and faculty and for their efforts in organizing this meaningful and effective webinar. Along with them, I wish to appreciate the faculty of the Department of Mathematics who are the backbone for the success of this webinar. Congratulations to all. I am also happy with the choice of the resource persons, Dr. Titus and Dr. Anto Kingsley, who consented to be amidst us in online mode to share their knowledge and experiences. Let us be enriched through their presentation and obtain good knowledge on distances and algorithms in graphs for better understanding of the concepts. Life is uncertain and full of challenges. Let us equip ourselves with knowledge technologically and accept the challenges. 
At this juncture, I would like to congratulate and extend my sincere appreciation to the Department of Mathematics for releasing their annual newsletter. I am sure it is the sincere efforts of each member of the department and the editorial team which made this come true. Congratulations once again. This webinar allows for better understanding of mathematical concepts and bring together professors, scholars and students on an equal platform. I am sure that this webinar will be extremely beneficial and fruitful for everyone present here. Wishing you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Sister, for your felicitation. Due to her busy schedule, Sister will leave the meet shortly. So we shall now proceed with the release of annual newsletter of the department. Usually, newsletter is released during our college day function. It wasn't possible due to COVID. So may I now, on behalf of the Department of Mathematics, take the privilege of releasing the annual newsletter 2019-20. Department of Mathematics, Holy Cross College Autonomous Nagarkoil proudly releases its annual newsletter 2019-2020. So this newsletter carries a message from the head of the Department of Mathematics, Dr. Arul Flameri. And the best outcome students are portrayed rank holders of French, Tamil and English. The events like Board of Studies, National Seminar organized and Sister Scholasticas and Mrs. Krishnamal's Endowment Lecture arranged. And our faculty has served as resource person and we have achieved 100% results. These are all the activities related to research staff and students attending webinars, seminars and publishing papers. And Jenny Sioni of 3rd BS Mathematics was selected as Vice President of the College Students Council. Ten of our students were motivated to compile their short stories and poetry as a book named Kortamuthukal. And Mathletes is a quiz club which motivates the students to participate in the quiz competitions and various other mathematical related competitions inside and outside of our college. So our girls have won so many prizes and students also involved in various other activities and by participating in many competitions organized inside and outside of our college and they have backed many prizes. Our students are the proud winners of the Rolling Trophy for the College Fine Arts Competition. And they have backed many prizes. Few of our final year students were selected in the campus placement. And our students involved in run activity that is reaching the unreached neighborhood. So. They had adopted a village, North Surangudi. They gave an awareness program. They could also involve in cleaning and planting. Activities of the Mathematics Association were carried out very successfully with the help of staff advisors and the student representatives. Many programs were organized and in few programs, our students were the resource persons. And we had also conducted interdepartmental model making competition. So this has created an awareness and leadership skills in the students. There were also sessions on universal values and as every year we had also gone for the Christmas visit to a government school and helped the poor children. We had gone for the excursion with the final year students to Mysore and Bangalore and for the industrial visit to Priyadashni Planetorium. Bhargavi of 3rd BSc is the proud winner of many prizes in chess in the national, state and district level competitions. And we organize Precious Day and students celebrate Teacher's Day. Collaborative work is well carried out 
in our department and we are 11 faculty members. and the editorial board team members. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Lima, for spending your precious time and felicitating the event. On behalf of the Department of Mathematics and now all the participants of this webinar, we offer our gratitude to you. Thank you, Sister. The participants are free to ask any doubts or questions from the speakers by typing them in the chat box on YouTube. Participants in Google Meet are free to ask your doubts or questions from the respective speakers once their session ends. May I now hand over the session to our eminent resource person, Dr. Titus, head of the Department of Science and Humanities, University College of Engineering, Nagarkoi. Please, sir. Thank you, sister. Good morning to all. I'm very happy to meet you through this Google Meet platform. For that, first of all, I wish to thank the head of the Department of Mathematics, Dr. Arul Flower Mary, and the conveners of this webinar, Mrs. Magila and Sister Andin Mary, for giving me this opportunity. Also, I extend my sense of thanks to the management of this institute and the faculty members of the Department of Mathematics, Holy Cross College, Nagarguil. In this talk, I'm going to share something about the topic distances in graphs. After that, my professor, Dr. Andrew Kinsley, sir, is going to share about the algorithmic aspect related to distances in graphs. Okay. Now, for our convenience, I can split my presentation into five parts. They are first one is introduction, second one is distance. Distance means that is based on the usual distance that means that is based on the um, shortest path third one is d2 distance that is based on the longest path and the fourth one is monophonic distance that is based on a cordless path and the last one is conclusion okay so first part is introduction nowadays graph theory plays an important role in mathematics research distance is one of the most important concept of distance in graph theory okay to illustrate the basic concepts related to our topic, we just consider the graph G shown in the figure. Okay, um, I think all of you know the definition of uh, path, isn't it? Okay, so I, I assume all of you know the definition of path. Okay, using that assumption, I proceed my presentation. So just we take two vertices x and y. Now just we collect all possible paths joining the vertices x and y. Okay. So can you give a path joining the vertices x and y? Okay, I can give the path. So the first path joining the vertices x and y is x, u1, u2, u3, y. Then the next possible path joining the vertices x and y is x, v, y. Then we have another path joining the vertices x and y is x, a, b, y. Okay, then can you give one more path joining the vertices x and y? Yes, we can. We have another path joining the vertices x and y is x, y, sorry, x, w, y. Now, is there any other path joining the vertices x and y? No, so we have only four possible paths joining the vertices x, x and y. They are p1, p2, p3, and p4. Okay. Out of the four paths, we have two paths are shortest paths. Shortest path means based on the length of the path, we can say shortest path. Okay, so length means number of edges in a path is length. Okay, number of edges in a path is length, length of the path. Okay, now for the first path, the length is four. For the second path, P2, the length is two. For the third path, the length is three. For the third, fourth path, the length is two. So here we have two shortest paths, P2 and P4. Hereafter, we can call a shortest path as geodesic. So geodesic is the technical word of technical word of shortest path. So hereafter, instead of calling this shortest path, we can say that as a geodesic. Okay. So here P2 and P4 are geodesics. Similarly, we have one longest path, that is P1. This is the longest path, okay, having the length four. Okay, so hereafter we can call this longest path as D2. 
okay d2 is the technical word of the longest path so p1 is the longest path that is d2 and p2 and p4 are the six. okay then now uh, second topic is distance okay so the distance the first one is the definition the distance between two vertices u and v is the length of and u to be geodesic and it is denoted by the symbol d of e comma v so the notation for the distance between the two vertices x and y is d of e comma v and it is nothing but a distance means just the uh, length of the u to be geodesic okay or we can rewrite that as length of a shortest u to be path or we can rewrite that as the number of edges in a shortest u to be path okay so these are the different types of the definitions of distance okay distance means just we can identify the number of edges in the shortest u to be path or number of edges in the x u to be geodesic okay now <clears throat> Next one gives the boundaries of uh, the parameter d of e comma v. Okay, so all of you know distance is always non-negative. Distance is always non-negative. That means d of e comma v is greater than or equal to zero. And again, here we can use <coughs> this is a path. Uh, this d of e comma is based on the geodesic. That is based on a path. So in a path, we have at, at most p minus uh, p minus one edges. In any graph, we have. Uh, we can take a path having only p up to p minus one edges. So here the upper bound of the distance d of u comma b for any two vertices u and b is p minus one. Therefore, this distance lies between zero and p minus one. Okay. So zero and p minus one are the bounds of the distance usual distance d of u comma b. Okay. <clears throat> now the bounds are sharp. That is. For the bounds, so here uh, in the previous result, we have the bound, uh, bound a uh, lower bound for the uh, distance d of e comma v is zero, and the upper bound for the distance d of e comma v is p minus one. Okay. Now here there exists a connected graph G with the lower bound, which satisfies the lower bound d of e comma v equal to zero. Similarly, it satisfies the upper bound d of e comma v equal to p minus one. For for that, just we consider a path having five vertices. That is p five. So in P5, we have five vertices and four edges. Now here, if I take the vertices are U and V, that is just to take U and V are the end vertices of the path P5. Okay. Now what's the length of this path? That is what is D of U comma V? D of U comma V is the number of edges in a U to V geodesic or number of edges in a shortest U to V path. So here we have a unique path. Here the number of edges is four. So the distance between u and v is 4. That is d of u comma v equal to 4. Okay. And the number of vertices here is 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So p equal to 5. So we have d of u comma v equal to 4 equal to p minus 1. Okay. Hence we have uh, this d of u comma v satisfies the upper bound p minus 1. Now uh, for the lower bound, if I take the vertex w, just to take w and we treat this w equal to u and w equal to v. So u equal to w and v equal to w. So what is the distance between d of uh, u comma v? d of u comma v means just to take the vertex w. So d of u here we assume the value u equal to w and v is also w. So we have d of u comma u equal to d of w comma w equal to the number of edges in the w to w path here there is no path joining the vertices w and w so number of edges here is zero therefore we have d of w comma w equals zero or here we assume the value u equal to w and v equal to w therefore we have d of u comma w uh, v equal to zero okay now um, the next one is distance is a metric okay so to prove the distance d of u comma is a metric on the vet, uh, on the a set of vertices v okay it is enough to verify the four conditions of metric so the first condition is d of u comma v is non-negative that is greater than or equal to zero already we have uh, all the vertices all the um, distances are positive always positive therefore we have d of u comma v greater than or equal to zero then the second one is reflexive property reflexive that is d of u comma v equal to zero if find only if u equal to v okay if I take the first direct part, that is, if d of u comma v equals zero, then 
we have uh, then we have the geodesic from u to v has no edges that is the number of edges in the u to v geodesic is zero that is the number of edges in the u to v path is zero that means there is no path joining the vertices u and v there is no path joining the vertices u and v means we assume that u equal to v otherwise this is a, this gives a contradiction because we assume this g is a connected graph a simple connected graph in a connected graph for any two vertices there is a path there exists a path but here there is no path joining the vertices u and v because we have d of u comma v equal to zero therefore we have the value u equal to v okay so the converse part in the converse part if we assume the value u equal to v then we derive we can easily derive the value d of v comma v equal to zero already we derived that result using an example that is using the path p5 okay then the fourth the third one is symmetric property that is d of u comma v equal to d of v uh, d of u comma v equal to d of v comma u that is just we interchange the notations u and v u and v okay now here if i take d of u comma v here we have one u to v geodesic that is the number of we know that the number of edges in an u to v geodesic is same as the number of edges in a v to u geodesic okay just be uh, change the order that's all okay so the path is the same path the geodesic path is the same path so the number of vertices from u to v and the number of vertices from v to u are the same therefore the distance between these two are same hence we have the symmetric property okay then the fourth one is triangular property that is d of u comma v less than or equal to d of u comma w plus d of w comma v okay so to prove this triangular inequality just we consider three vertices u w and v okay already we have uh, in the right side we have a part d of u comma w that means the distances between u and w from this distance clearly there exists a u2 and u2 w geodesic okay there is u2 w geodesic for our convenience yeah, i take uh, this uh, p1 is a geodesic joining the vertices u and w okay so this is the path p1 this is the geodesic joining the vertices u and w then let based on the second part of the right side d of w comma v we assume another path p2 from w to v so here p1 and p2 are the two geodesics okay now if i combine these two geodesics p1 and p2 at the point w just we join this p1 and p2 at the point through the point w then we get another path uh, from u to v so p1 union p2 is a path this path need not be a geodesic already we have the segments p1 and p2 are geodesics but if you combine these two and through the point or at the point w then we get another path clearly this is a path this path need not be a geodesic okay okay so here we have two cases based on this new path p1 union p2 if p1 union p2 is a geodesic okay this may be a geodesic okay so if p1 union p2 is a geodesic then we have this uh, d of u comma v is equal to d of u comma w plus d of w comma v okay if we combine these two that is the uh, length of this p1 union p2 then the second case is um, p1 union p2 is not a geodesic okay that is this p1 union p2 is a path but this need not be a geodesic so here we assume the second case is p1 union p2 is not a geodesic okay if p1 union p2 is not a geodesic then clearly there exists another geodesic say p another geodesic from u to v so let p be a geodesic from u to v okay now here we have one length isn't it so the length of p is clearly strictly less than the length of p1 union p2 so the because this p is a geodesic and p1 union p2 is not a geodesic that means when we compare the length of p with p1 union p2 clearly the length of p is less strictly less than the length of p1 union p2 okay from that we have d of p means d of u to v u comma v is less strictly less than p of uh, d of p1 that is d of u comma w plus uh, d of p2 that is d of w comma v so if we combine these two cases that is the, uh, our required result d of u comma v 
is less than or equal to d of u comma w plus d of w comma v okay this is the third property and the fourth one okay so hence we have all the four properties of this uh, um, <coughs> matrix is satisfied hence we conclude that the distance usual distance small d is always matrix on the vertex set v okay now here we, um, we have based on the usual distance we have three three standard and important parameters first one is based on the vertex and the remaining two parameters are based on the graph okay so here we have three parameters we have three parameters first one is based on the vertex of a graph vertex of a graph that is e of v and the remaining two parameters are based on the graph okay so the first one is eccentricity of a vertex v in a graph g the eccentricity is denoted by the symbol e of v and it is defined as the maximum of the distances from v to any other vertex u in v okay we define the eccentricity as e of v equal to maximum of the distances from v to all the remaining vertices in v and using this uh, eccentricity of a vertex we can define the radius of the graph g radius of graph g is defined as the minimum of the eccentricities taken over all the vertices in the graph g okay minimum of the eccentricities for all the vertices in the graph g okay then in the same way we can define the diameter as diameter of g is denoted by dm g and it is defined as the maximum of the eccentricities among all the vertices of the graph g okay so these are the very very important parameters okay these are the very very uh, important parameters based on the these three important uh, important parameters we have so many results and properties in the literature okay you can uh, refer all these parameters in our textbooks and in the reference papers also okay then the main topic is geo domination geo domination geo domination is one of the most important concept of distances in graphs the geodetic sets and the geo domination number of a graph were introduced and studied by buckley harare and quintas in the year in the year 1988 since then many related concepts and interesting results were developed and studied by many others from different countries however chart trend and chan have done a tremendous work in this area okay in india my guide dr ap sandagumaran have done a tremendous work in this area okay you can refer these data using um, the papers okay the next one is the definition of uh, geo domination number this is a very very important parameter in distance in graphs so geo domination number or another name of this is geodetic number so the standard the first uh, uh, introduced notation for the uh, number is geo domination number afterwards it is renamed as a geodetic number okay the definition is let g be a connected graph a set s of vertices of g is called a geo dominating set if every vertex of g lies on an x to y geodesic for some vertices x and y in s the minimum cardinality among the geodominating sets is called the geodomination number and it is denoted by the symbol g of g. A geodominating set of cardinality g of g is called a g set. Okay. So, once again, uh, read this. Geodominating set. Geodominating set is a subset S of the vertex set V satisfying the condition every vertex of g lies on next to y geodesic for some vertices x and y in S okay every vertex of g lies on an x to y geodesic for some vertices x and y in s so to illustrate this concept we consider the graph g shown in the figure okay now uh, here the problem is just find the geo domination number for the graph g given in the figure okay to find the geo domination number we need geo dominating set but to find the geo dominating set we need geodesic but to form a geodesic, we need two vertices. So we can start with the two-point set. If I take the two-point set as x comma y, okay. Now to verify the conditions for this geodominating set, first identify the geodesics joining the vertices x and y. 
So uh, here the we have uh, three geodesics joining the vertices x and y. This is a geodesic joining the vertices x and y, and this is another geodesic joining the vertices x and y. Similarly, this is a third geodesic joining the vertices x and y. But this path is not a geodesic. Okay. Now here, uh, from this uh, geodesic path, we conclude that the vertices x, u, and y lies lie on this x to y geodesic. Similarly, the vertex v also lies on this geodesic. In the same way, the vertex w also lies on this geodesic. But what about the points a and b? So clearly, these two vertices, that is the vertices a and b, do not lie on any geodesic joining the vertices x and y. So clearly, the two points that x comma y is not a geodominating set. Okay. So then we can go for another two point set. If I take the another two point set as u comma w, then here also verify the conditions. Here the vertices u, x, and w lie on this geodesic. Similarly, the vertex y lies on this geodesic. But the vertices v, a, and b do not lie on any u to w geodesic. Therefore, this two point set u comma w is also not a geodominating set. In the same way, we can easily verify uh, verify that no two point will uh, no two point set will form a geodominating set. So we can go for a three point set. If I take the three point set as three point set as this x y a. Now clearly, every vertex of G lies on either an x to y geodesic or an or a y to a geodesic. Clearly. Uh, the vertices x, u, and y lies on this geodesic. The vertex v lies on this geodesic. Uh, this uh, w lies on the geodesic x to y. And the vertices a and b also lies on this y to a geodesic. Therefore, the three point set x, comma y, comma a is a geodominating set of G. Since this is a geodominating set with the minimum cardinality, we can say this is a G set. Minimum geodominating set is called a G set. So this is a G set. And also we have we can identify the geodomination number G of G as 3. Minimum cardinality, that is 3. Okay. Now this is a geodominating set with the minimum cardinality. That is this is a G set. Now can you identify one more path, one more set, one more G set? Mm, we can easily identify another geodominating set as this X, Y, B. Clearly, every vertex of G lies on either an X to Y geodesic or an X to B geodesic. Therefore, this three point set X comma Y comma B is also a G set. Okay. So from this uh, definition or from this example, we can conclude one result as G set need not be unique. G set need not be unique. So we have two or more G set. Okay. Now, now here we have some properties. And we have some properties of this geodominating sets. Okay, so to prove the uh, properties of geodominating set, we need these two terms, or we need these two definitions. First one is neighborhood. Second one is simply silver vertex. Neighborhood. So the definition is the neighborhood of a vertex V is the set N of V consisting of all vertices U which are adjacent with V. The minimum of this is the notation for the neighborhood of V is N of V, and this N of V is a set containing all the adjacent vertices of V. Collection of all adjacent vertices of uh, V gives N of V, that is, neighborhood of V. Then, uh, next definition is a vertex V is called a simply sealed vertex or extreme vertex if the subgraph induced by its neighbors is complete. Okay, so to verify uh, the to verify whether the vertex is simply sealed or not, we can check two conditions. First one is first identify the neighborhood of the vertex V, then verify whether the induced subgraph of um, V is simply uh, <coughs> complete or not. If the induced subgraph is complete, then we say that vertex is a simply sealed vertex or extreme vertex. Okay, so for that, just we consider this example. So there's a graph. And here take a uh, yeah, vertex v1 now identify the nature of the vertex v1 that is verify whether the vertex v1 is simply sealed or not so to verify the uh, nature of this vertex v1 
first we can identify the neighborhood of the vertex v1 neighborhood means set of all adjacent vertices of v1 so uh, set of all adjacent vertices is the two points set v2 comma v3 and the second condition its induced subgraph is complete now what is the induced subgraph of the vertices v2 and v3 clearly it is a it is a complete graph k2 this is a uh, this is an edge v2 v3 so clearly that is equivalent to k2 so the induced subgraph of the neighborhood of v1 is complete therefore we can say this v1 is a yes, simply cell vertex or extreme vertex. Now, what about the vertex V4? V4, again, to verify the nature V4, so identify its neighborhood. The neighborhood of this vertex V4 is V2, V5, V2, comma V5, and its induced subgraph in G is uh, this vertex V2, that is K1, union another vertex v5 that is k1 so k1 union k1 so k1 union k1 is clearly not a complete graph so the induced subgraph of v4 uh, is not complete therefore we can say this v4 is not a simply cell vertex okay then what about the vertex v7 v7 you can verify this so v7 okay, its neighborhood is v6 v6 its induced subgraph is the complete graph K1. Here we have only one vertex. So its induced subgraph is K1. That is a complete graph. Therefore, V7 is also a simply cell vertex. Okay. Now, from this example, we have one result. Okay. Every end vertex is a simply cell vertex. But the converse need not be true. Every simply cell vertex, every end vertex is a simply cell vertex. But the converse need not be true. Okay, so already we have this is an end vertex. End, of, end vertex means its degree must be one. So clearly it is an end vertex and it, uh, it is a simply cell vertex. So every end vertex is a simply cell vertex, but a simply cell vertex need not be an end vertex. Already we, we have this V1 is a simply cell vertex, but it is not a end vertex. Okay, so we have that result. Every end vertex is a simply cell vertex, but the converse need not be. True. That means a simply cell vertex need not be an end vertex. Okay. So using that, uh, using these two definitions, we can prove this uh, theorem. There's a there's a very very important property of geodominatic set. Here, every simply cell vertex belongs to every geodominatic set of G. That is, if we take A is a simply cell vertex of the graph G, then clearly this A is an element of any geodominatic set of G. Then the second property is no cut vertex of G belongs to any G set of G. G set means minimum. Here we have geodominating set, any geodominating set, but here we have uh, the concept based on the minimum geodominating set, that is G set. So no cut vertex belongs to any G set or any minimum geodominating set of G. So here uh, and, and for the proof, just I give a skeleton. Okay, I give a skeleton of the proof. Okay, so just to consider a graph G. Um, let G, S be a geodominating set of G. We consider S is a geodominating set of G. And let U be a simply cell vertex of G. Here we are going to prove that cell U is an element of S. U is an element of S. Now here we can use the method of contradiction. So in mathematics, we have one important technique is method of contradiction. So here we can use the method of contradiction. Okay. Here, uh, if uh, suppose that U is not in S, U is not an element of S, then what will happen? S lies outside the set S. U is not in S. Then, using the definition of the geodominating set, since U lies outside the set S, okay, there exist at least two vertices X and Y in S such that U is an internal vertex of this X to Y geodesic. Okay, using the definition of geodominating set, since u lies outside the set s yes, clearly u lies on an x to y geodesic okay so here we have one geodesic okay now here um let v and w be let v and w be the neighboring vertices of u on the path p on the geodesic p so already we have this x to y geodesic since u is not equal to x and not equal to y there exist at least two vertices V and W along uh, along the path P. Okay. Now here again use the definition of this U, simply cell vertex. 
ओके और फ्रॉम एक्स टू वै एस एक्स टू डब्ल्यू देन द एज डब्ल्यू वी देन द पाथ वी टू वाई सो दिस इज ए न्यू पाथ दैट दिस इज अ पाथ अदर देन पी ओके सो इट इज पी वन सो सेकेंड पाथ पी वन इज एक्स टू डब्ल्यू देन द एज डब्ल्यू वी एंड द पाथ वी टू वाई वी टू वाई ओके नाउ व्हेन वी कंपेयर द लेंथ ऑफ पी विद पी वन क्लियरली द लेंथ ऑफ पी इज ग्रेटर देन द लेंथ ऑफ पी वन Okay, length of P is greater than the length of the new path P one because we have two edges. In the path here, we have two edges. Okay, corresponding to this uh, two edges, in P one we have single edge. So clearly, the length of the path P is greater than the length of P one, or the length of P is equal to the length of P one plus one. Okay, so hence we have another geodesic. Okay, which is a contradiction to the path P is a yeah? geodesic okay so we derived a contradiction hence we have the result every simple cell vertex belongs to the set tree s okay so this is just the outline of the proof okay in the same way we can do the second one just i skip that one then the next one is vertex geodomination number actually the parameter geodomination number is defined in the sense of there is exactly one geodomination number for a graph Okay, so corresponding to a graph G, we have only one number parameter that is your domination number. In the year 2005, we we means myself and my guide Dr. A. P. Sandeep Kumaran defined and developed the concept of your domination by fixing a vertex of a graph. Okay, that is with respect to each vertex of a graph G, we define a corresponding your domination number. Thus, the new parameter vertex geodomination number is based on, okay, based not only on the graph but also based on the vertex of a graph. Okay, so corresponding to each vertex of a graph, we have a parameter. Okay, so its the definition is: Let X be any vertex of a connected graph G. A set S of vertices of G is called an X geodominating set. If every vertex of G lies on an X to Y geodesic for some vertex Y and S, yes. similar to the previous one, the minimum cardinality among the X geodomination set gives the geodomination number. There is X geodomination number, and it is denoted by the symbol G X sub G or simply G X. An X geodominating set of cardinality G X sub G is called a G X set. Okay, so X geodominating set is based on each vertex of a graph G. Here. The main difference between geodominating set and the X geodominating set is, so in the geodominating set we have X to Y geodesic, okay. That is in that X to Y geodesic X and Y may vary, but here uh, in the X to Y geodesic X is fixed. That is the in initial point of the geodesic is fixed. That is the main difference between the usual geodominating set and the vertex geodominating set, okay. Okay, to illustrate this concept, consider the graph G shown in the figure. So, in this figure, okay, already we have the geodominating set and the geodomination number. We can easily identify the geodomination number is two because the geodominating set is u comma y. If you take the two point set as u comma y, then clearly every vertex of G lies on either this geodesic or this geodesic. Therefore, the geodomination number for the given graph is two. But um, here we are going to find the geoda vertex geodomination number corresponding to each vertex of a graph G. For that, first I take the vertex as x. Okay. Now to find the x geodomination number, we need x geodominating set. For that, we need x to y geodesic. And here x is fixed. For all the geodesics, the initial value x is fixed. So it is enough to vary the uh, the upper limit y. Okay, so for that here we start with the single point set. If I take the single point set as U, then what will happen? Here the vertices x, v, and u lies on this x to u geodesic. 
but the vertices y and w do not lie on any x to u z set therefore the single point set is not a not a x denominating set of g so in the same way we can go for the next point next single point set w here also the vertex u does not lie on any x to y x to w z set therefore the single point set w is also not a x denominating set of g in this way we can easily verify no single point set will form a geodominating set so we can go for a two point set here if i take the two point set as this u comma w then clearly every vertex of g lies on either an x to u geodesic or this x to w geodesic hence okay the two point set u comma w is a gx set and gx sub g equal to true Okay. In the same way, if I fix the vertexes uh, u instead of fixing the vertex x, if I fix the vertex u, then the single point set y is clearly a g u set because every vertex of g lies on either this u to y geodesic or another u to y geodesic. Therefore, the single point set y is a g u set. Therefore, g u of g equal to one. Okay. Then. This uh, table shows the vertices of the graph and its corresponding minimum vertex geodominating sets and its corresponding vertex geodomination numbers. So corresponding to each vertex, if I fix the vertex W, then we have the corresponding uh, minimum vertex geodominating set and its corresponding vertex geodomination number two. Okay. Uh, in this way, here also we have so many properties related to this. Okay. You can refer these uh, properties in the uh, in your um in the reference papers okay now here the next theorem is this uh, this is exactly similar to the previous one so just to be omit this now related to this uh, um geodesic path and geodesic okay we have or uh, based on this usual distance we have the geodomination number based on the geodomination number we have so many related topics the related topics are First one is upper geodomination number, forcing geodomination number, connected geodomination number, upper connected geodomination number, forcing connected geodomination number, connected forcing connected geodomination number, edge geodomination number, etc. We have so many parameters related to this topic geodomination number. Okay. Then the uh, uh, similar to this vertex geodomination number also, we have so many parameters. We have so many new parameters. So the best parameter related to this vertex denomination number is geo number. Okay, similarly we have the other parameters. Okay, so next topic is d two distance. Okay, actually we have studied a distance based on geodesic, isn't it? The previous uh, um, previous one is distance that is usual distance that is based on the geodesic. Okay, then the next one is based on a longest path longest path means detoured path okay so hereafter we can call a longest path as a d2 so you can remember uh, a longest path is also called a d2 okay the d2 distance was introduced by charton escatro and chang in the year 1990 okay since then many related concepts and interesting results were developed by so many others from different countries okay so to illustrate this concept this d2 distance which okay first we can define this d2 distance based on the d2 path so the length of an u2 v d2 is called a d2 distance and it is denoted by the symbol capital d of u comma v so already we have the usual distances small d of u comma v now here we have the d2 distances denoted by the symbol capital d so capital d of u comma v okay and here and the length of this u to v d2 or the length of a longest u to v a path is called the d2 distance okay to illustrate this concept we can consider the graph g shown in the figure okay so already we have okay already we identified all the possible paths joining the vertices x and y so we have four paths joining the vertices x and y out of the four paths Okay, two paths are shortest paths, that is geodesic paths, so don't worry about the, uh, that geodesic path. Okay, and we have one path that is a longest path, that is a D2. 
So longest path are D2. So here we have X2, Y, D2 is this X, U1, U2, U3 and Y. Okay, this is the longest path. Okay, so we can say this is a D2. Okay, then uh, uh, here we can consider one more example. Now, can you identify the D2 joining the vertices U and V? U, U and V. Okay, so here we have two paths joining the vertices U and V. First path is this UV. Next path is U, A, B, Y. So here the longest path is this U, A, B, V. So this is a D2. Okay. Now, here we have some properties similar to the D2 uh, usual distances. Okay. So, uh, similar to the previous one, D2 distance also lies between lies between 0 and P minus 1. So, the bounds for the distance D2 distance is uh, 0 and P minus 1. Bounds are 0 and P minus 1. Next one, this is also similar to the usual one. So, D of U, V equals 0. If find only if U equal to V. Then the next one is similar to the previous one that is d2 distance is also a map on the vectors uh, on the vertex set v okay next one is the relation between the distance and usual distance next one is the relation between usual distance and the d2 distance okay already we know that okay already we know that the number of edges in a geodesic is clearly less than or equal to the number of edges in a D2 path. Okay, so that is when we come back the shortest path and the longest path. Okay, the number of edges in a shortest path is clearly less than or equal to the number of edges in a longest path. From that, we have the number of edges in a geodesic is less than or equal to the number of edges in a, a, a D2 path. From that, we have D of U, e, V is less than or equal to capital D of U, e, V. Already we know that these two parameters D and capital D lies between 0 and P minus 1. So from that we have the result 0 less than or equal to D of E comma V less than or equal to capital D of E comma V less than or equal to P minus 1. Okay. Then the next one is in an even cycle 2N, we have D of E comma V equal to capital D of E comma V equal to N if U and V are two antipodal vertices of the graph G. If you and V are the antipodal vertices, then we have the usual distance and D2 distance are the same. This is only for an even cycle. Okay. So, so here if I take this as an even cycle, here we take two antipodal vertices U and V. This U and V are the antipodal vertices. Antipodal vertices means the eccentricity of U is equal to eccentricity of V equal to the distance between U and V. X and E of U equal to E of V equal to D of E comma B. These three values must be same. Then we say U and V are eccentric vertices. Now, here uh, we have two distinct paths joining the vertices U and V having the same length. Having the same length. We have only two paths having the same length. Therefore, the usual distance D of U comma V and the D2 distance uh, capital D of U comma V are same. Okay, hence we have the result. Suppose U and V are not antipodal vertices. For example, if I consider, okay, if I consider U and V clearly, U and V are non antipodal vertices. Then the distance between these two is 1, and the uh, D2 distance between U and V is uh, this 2n minus 1. Total number of vertices is 2n. So the D2 distance from U to V is 2n minus. Uh, we start from this, okay, and end with this U. That gives uh, 2n minus 1 vertices, okay. Therefore, D of small D of U comma V is not equal to capital D of U comma V, okay. Then the next one is uh, D of U comma V equal to capital D of U comma V for every vertices U and V if and only if the graph G is a tree. This is another result based on a tree. Okay, so here also, if I take the direct part as d of u comma v equal to direct part d of u comma v equal to capital D of u comma v for any two vertices u and v in G, then we prove that G is a tree. Okay, first we assume the value this d of u comma v equal to capital D of u comma v for any two vertices u and v in G. Using that assumption, we can prove the result G is a tree. Here also we can use the method of contradiction that is if g is not a tree 
then we are going to derive a contradiction. If G is not a tree, then G must contain at least one cycle. Okay, then G must contain at least one cycle. Suppose we have a graph like this. In this graph, we have a cycle like this. Now, in this graph, in this uh, um, <clears throat> in this non-tree, that is a graph having the cycle, just we take two adjacent vertices U and V. Take two adjacent vertices U and V. Now, the usual distance between these two vertices is 1. And the D2 distance between U and V is 3. 1, 2 and 3. So clearly, D of U, V is not equal to capital D of U, V. That is a contradiction. Already we assumed that is equal to equal. So we derive a contradiction. Similarly, if we take G is a tree, converse part, if G is a tree, then we can prove the result D of U, V equal to capital D of U, V for any two vertices U and V. Okay. If G is, uh, if G is a tree, then what will happen? If we take any two vertices, then we have exactly only one path joining the vertices U and V. Okay. So here also, if I take the vertices A and B, here also, we have a unique path joining the vertices A and B. Okay. So we know that in a tree, okay, we have a unique path joining, joining any two vertices in T. Okay. Therefore, we have a unique path means that path is geodesic, both geodesic and D2. So that we have small d of u comma v equal to capital D of u comma v. In that way, we can easily derive that result. Okay. Then the next next one is as usual. Here we have d two eccentricity. We can define d two eccentricity, uh, then d two radius and d two diameter exactly similar to the usual distance. Okay. Then we have the next result is now we have the comparison with the um, usual eccentricity with the detour eccentricity. Since um, based on for any two vertices u and v in g, okay, d of u comma v is less than or equal to capital D of u comma v. Using that concept, the eccentricity of v is less than or equal to d to eccentricity of v for any vertex v in g. Okay, using this eccentricity, and that is using this relation, we can easily derive the re uh, result as radius sub g is less than or equal to, to uh, d to radius, <coughs> and uh, diameter of g is less than or equal to d to diameter. So we can easily derive this from the previous results. Okay, now here very very important uh, concept is based on the neighbor. So already we have the usual neighbor, isn't it? Now here we are going to define D2 neighbor, okay? So already we studied, we have studied this D and uh, usual neighbor, usual neighbor, okay? What's the definition of this neighbor? A vertex is called a neighbor of V if, what is the condition? A vertex is called a neighbor of V if U is adjacent with V. If U and V are adjacent, then we say U is a, a neighbor of V or V is a neighbor of U. Or we have another definition is d of u comma v equal to 1. This is an equivalent form. U is adjacent with v means the distance between these two is 1. Okay. Or we have another definition is u is a vertex distinct from v whose distance from v is minimum. Okay. So the actual definition of the neighbor is this. Okay. So these two are the particular cases of this definition. So actual definition of a neighbor is this. Okay. I think many of you don't know this formula, isn't it? This definition. But this is a very, very important definition of neighbor. Okay. These two are the deductions, are the particular cases of this definition. Okay. The definition is U is a vertex distinct from V. That is U not equal to V. And its distance from V is minimum. Okay. So if you uh, take this definition from this, we can easily derive this. So, uh, um, uh, the V is minimum means we have at least one neighboring vertices, um, neighbor vertex gives the value D of U comma V equal to 1. So, we can easily derive these two from this. Okay. Now, using this definition of neighbor, we can define the D2 neighbor. So, the next definition is a vertex U is, a vertex U is called a D2 neighbor of V if U is a vertex distinct from V whose D2 distance from V is minimum. Instead of distance, here we have a D2 distance. Okay. U is a vertex distinct from V. That is U not equal to V whose D2 distance from V is minimum. Okay. So here don't use the notation D of U comma V equal to 1. 
okay in the previous uh, definition we used the notation d of u comma v equal to one okay don't use this definition here okay so the only definition based on this d2 neighbor is this u is the vertex distinct from v whose d2 distance from v is minimum okay now um to explain this just consider the graph g shown here okay here identify the and uh, d2 neighbor of the vertex v fix the vertex v now identify the d2 neighbor of the vertex v okay so to find the d2 neighbor of the vertex v just we can identify the d2 distances from v to all the many vertices in the graph g okay so first identify the distances so what is the d2 distance from v to u so here we take the path as this along this path we have the d2 uh, d2 distances six then uh, the d2 distance from v to is a this take this path along this path we have okay path we have the distances four so capital d of v comma is equal to four then uh, capital d of v comma w equal to three in the same way d of v comma x take this path along this path we have capital d of v comma x equal to four and d of v comma y equal to five okay out of this um this distance is three four and five the minimum distance is three corresponding to the distance three we have the vertex is v so w therefore <coughs> therefore the vertex w is a d2 neighbor of the vertex v so you can remember this here w is the d2 neighbor of v so what is the neighbor of v here we have the neighboring vertices of v are u and y but the d2 neighbor of the vertex v is w this is not u so you have to say that the neighbor is not the d2 neighbor that is based on the longest distance okay that is the d2 neighbor as w okay then uh, if i take the next one as this v so here we consider this e odd cycle previous one is even cycle here we consider an odd cycle here also to find the neighboring vertices first we can find the d2 distances from v to all the many vertices so if i take the vertices v and u then the d2 neighbor of uh, d2 distance from v to u is 1 2 3 4 so 4 then the d2 uh, distance from v to is it is 3 d2 distance from v to x is uh, 3 d2 distance from v to y is 2 so among the uh, distances 2 and mm, among the distances 2 and 3 okay 2 sorry so here uh, the distance from v to u is along this path we have 4 isn't it so the d2 distance from v to u is 4 the d2 distance from v to is it is 3 the d2 distance from v to x is 3 the d2 distance from v to y is 4 so we have two uh, distances 3 and 4 okay among these 3 uh, and 4 we have the uh, length minimum length is 3 so based on the length 3 we have the d2 neighbors of hmm, x and z so the d2 neighbors of the vertex v are x and z okay in the same way can you identify the d2 neighbor of the vertex v so vertex v ude d2 neighbor kandupidikka mudiyuma so the d2 neighbor of the vertex v is here also find the distance d2 distances from v to all the remaining vertices here the d2 distance from v to u is 4 the d2 distance from v to u is at is 3 the d2 distance from v to x is again 3 the d2 distance from v to y is 4 but the d2 distance from v to w is only 1 so the minimum length this one based on that length one we have the d2 neighbor of v is w so the d2 neighbor of the vertex v is w so in this way we can easily identify the d2 neighbors of the vertex x so here d2 neighbor is entirely different from the usual neighbor okay you can remember that one <coughs> okay then and um, we have one parameter based on the d2 number i'm um, d2 distance okay that parameter is hmm, d2 number actually the d2 number of a graph was introduced by charton and chang in the year 2003 and further studied by many others from different countries so usually okay actually this parameter was introduced by charton and chang in the year 2003 okay now here the definition of the d2 numbers 
um, this is similar to the geodominating set. Okay, here let G be a connected graph. A set S of vertices of G is called a D2 set. If every vertex of G lies on an X2, Y, D2 for some vertices X and Y in S. The minimum cardinality of a D2 set is called the D2 number and it is denoted by the symbol DN of G. The minimum D2 set is called the DN set. Already the, we have the notation for the minimum D, uh, geodominating set is G set. Similar to that, we have the minimum D2 set is called D set, DN set. Okay. Now uh, here, instead of taking the uh, geodesic pass, here we consider D2 pass. That's all. Okay. Mm, here we just take the um, uh, graph. Now here, uh, find the D2 number of this graph. To find the <coughs> D2 number of the graph, we form the sets. Okay. So to, uh, here we consider a two point set. If I consider one point set, then um, there is no path joining the vertices x um, x to x. So we start with a two point set. If I take the two point set as x comma y, x comma u, first one is uh, x comma u, then what will happen? Okay, here the vertices, uh, here first identify the path. So this is a path, uh, this is one of the path joining the vertices x and y, and this is another path, and this is a third path joining the vertices x and u, and similarly we have the fourth path is this. Okay, out of these four paths, we have only one path is a detour path, that is along this path we have a detour so this is a detour path okay so here the vertices x a b y and u lies on this x to u geodesic path uh, sorry along this detour path so the vertices the w, v and w do not lie on any x to u d2 so clearly the two points at x comma u is <coughs> not yet d2 set of g so in this way, we can take the next two point set. If I take the next two point set as x comma a, now here we have the path of this is a shortest path and the longest path is this. That is the detour path is this. Similarly, this is another detour path and the third detour path is this. So here all the vertices of the graph G lies on an x to a detour path. All the vertices lies on an x to a detour path. Therefore, the two point set x comma a is a is a d2 set of g. Since it is of minimum cardinality, we can say this is a dn set, and dn of g equal to two. Here also we have uh, the other dn sets also. You can verify that one. Okay. Now here, hmm. here also we have a theorem based on um, the, um, so one of the properties. Every end vertex of G belongs to every D2 set of G. Every end vertex in the geodominating set, we have every simplicial vertex belongs to the geodominating set, but, but here end vertex of G belongs to every D2 set of G. Okay, just we can skip the definition uh, proof of this. Okay, now here also we have so many parameters related to this D2 number. These are some parameters related to D2 number and D2 distance. Okay. Then the next part is monophonic distance. Monophonic distance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> actually, we introduced, we means myself and my guide, Dr. A.P. Sandakumaran, introduced this monophonic distance in the year 2011. And we developed so many parameters related to this monophonic distance. Okay, so this monophonic distance is based on a cardless path. Cardless path. For that, we need the definition of card. So then, a card of a path P is an edge joining two non-adjacent vertices of P. A card means there is an edge satisfying this condition. A card of a path P is an edge joining two non-adjacent vertices of P. There is here we have one path, for example, suppose we have one path P. Now take two non-adjacent vertices. If the two non-adjacent vertices in P has an edge in G, has an edge in G, then we say that is a card. So pathinga or path and the path non-adjacent vertices are taking and the non-adjacent vertices or edge graph like in the other card. Okay. Um, so just to consider a path. And take any two non-adjacent any two non-adjacent vertices in P. 
If there exists an edge joining these two non-adjacent vertices E F G, then we say that is a card. Okay. Uh, then a path P is called a monophonic if it is a cardless path. Cardless path is called a monophonic path. Okay. Now here, uh, just consider this graph. Here we take the vertices V1 and V7. Here identify the monophonic path. Here we have uh, first identify the possible path. So the first path joining the vertices V1 and V7 is this V1, V3, V6, V7. Here along this path, there is no card. There is no card means no two non-adjacent vertices. These two are non-adjacent vertices. Here there is no card. There is no edge. So this path is a monophonic path. Then if I take the next path is V1, V2, V4, V5, V6, V7. Along this path also, here there is no card. There is no non-adjacent vertices having edge in the graph. So this is also a monophonic path. Okay. Then if I take the next path, this is V1, V2, V3, V6, V7. This is also a path. But here along this path, we have V1 and V3 are V1 and V3 are non-adjacent vertices in the path. But these two non-adjacent vertices have an edge in the graph G. In the path, there non-adjacent vertices and the graph is one edge. That's the card. So this V1, V3 is a card. Okay, this card. Therefore, this path is not a monophonic path. This is not a monophonic path. Similarly, if I take another path, V1, okay, V1, V3, V2, V4, V5, V6, V7. Take this path. So along this path, we have the two non-adjacent vertices V1 and V2. Along the path, along the path, V1, V2 is non-adjacent. But this V1, V2 has an edge in G. Therefore, this is a card. So this along this path, we have one card. Therefore, this is not a, not a monophonic path. Similarly, we have another card, this V3, V6. Okay. So uh, here we have totally four paths joining the vertices V1 and V7. Out of four possible paths, we have two paths are monophonic pass and the remaining two are non-monophonic pass. Okay. Then we have the monophonic distance. So the monophonic distance is defined as the length of a longest U to be monophonic path in G. Here we can define the longest. The length of a longest U to be monophonic path is called a monophonic distance. Okay. From the, from the previous example, we can easily identify that every, every geodesic is a monophonic path. So clearly this P1 is a geodesic joining the vertices V1 and V7. So we have the result is every geodesic is a monophonic path. But if monophonic path, this P2 need not be a geodesic. In this example, P2 is a monophonic path, but this P2 is not a, not a geodesic, not a shortest path. Okay. So you can remember this. Okay. No. Here, um, okay, suppose here, uh, here also we have, uh, we take this V1 and V7, then what's the distance, uh, monophonic distance between the vertices V1 and V7? The monophonic distance is the length of a longest monophonic path. Here we have, this is a monophonic path and this is another monophonic path. So the length of the longest, this is the longest monophonic path and its length is, its length is 2, 4, 1. So 5, okay. So the D2 monophonic distance from V1 to V7 is fine. Then if I take the vertices V1 and V3, then what's the monophonic distance? Here also we have three different paths. First path is this, this is the shortest path. And second path is this. So along this path, we have one card. So this is not a monophonic path. Then another path is along this direction, along this path. This is a path, but this is also not a monophonic path because here we have a card. Okay, from V1 to V3, there is an edge. So this is not a uh, monophonic path. So out of the four, uh, three paths, we have two paths are non-monophonic paths. And this is a, only one monophonic path. So its distance is one. So D of V1 comma V3 equal to one. Okay, so in this way, we can easily identify the numbers. Okay, so here also. Here also we have... Mm, uh, this D2 distance lies between uh, 0 and P minus 1. So already we, uh, we have studied three parameters, usual distance, D2 distance, and monophonic distance. All the three parameters lies between 0 and P minus 1. 
then again uh, we have the result uh, already i told you about this every geodesic is a monophonic path from that we have d of u comma b is less than or equal to dm of u comma b okay and again we have uh, this d of u comma b so this is my cordless path so every cordless path the um, the number of edges in a cordless path is clearly less than or equal to the number of edges in a longest path this is the longest path this is a cordless path so clearly the number of edges in this cordless path is less than or equal to the number of edges in the longest path therefore we have dm of e comma b less than or equal to this so we have this chain so this is this is a distance chain okay similar to <coughs> domination chain here we have a distance chain is zero less than or equal to small d of u comma v less than or equal to dm of u comma v less than or equal to capital d of u comma v less than or equal to p minus one okay so here also we have so many uh, parameters here the monophonic distance dm is not a metric already we have the usual distance and the d2 distances okay <coughs> the usual distance d and d2 distance um, d2 distance capital d are metrics okay but here the monophonic distance dm is not a metric okay for that we just consider the example here here what is the monophonic distance from v1 to v3 the distance between v1 and v3 is one similarly the distance uh, distance between v3 and v6 is again one then the d2 distance uh, monophonic distance from v1 to v6 is okay so along this path we have the distance is four so along the uh, here the monophonic distance between these two vertices is one the monophonic distance between these two vertices is one but the monophonic distance from v1 to v6 is four so clearly dm of v1 comma v6 is strictly greater than v1 comma v3 plus uh, plus dm of v3 comma v6 so triangle uh, inequality does not satisfy this dm that is monophonic distance does not satisfy the in monophonic in uh, sorry <clears throat> triangular inequality from this we conclude that this dm is not a metric on the vertex set v okay so here also we have uh, the definitions okay I think time is over. Okay. Um, time is nearly 11:30, so and we have one more concept. Just uh, two more minutes. Okay. So next one is monophonic number. So monophonic number. We can define this monophonic uh, set similar to uh, the previous sets. That is previous uh, monophonic uh, D2 set and the geodominating set. Okay. And we have the examples. You can verify that one. Okay. So here we can identify the monophonic number of this graph. Okay. So we can easily identify the monophonic numbers. Okay. Here we have the results. Um, clearly, the monophonic number lies between two and p. Okay. So uh, two and p are the bounds of the monophonic number parameter monophonic number. And again, similar to the previous one, every simplicial vertex of a connected graph belongs to every monophonic set of G. And no cut vertex of G belongs to any G set of G. Based on these two prime parameters, we can identify the monophonic numbers for some standard graphs. We can easily identify the numbers. So there's a complete graph. Since every vertex of a complete graph is a simplicial vertex, so all the simple, uh, all the vertices of KP belongs to the uh, monophonic set. Therefore, we have M of KP equal to P. Similarly, we have the other numbers. So I think with this, I can conclude my presentation. Okay. So you can refer uh, the papers for this. Okay. Now it's a time of um, questions. You can ask questions. Participants, you are free to ask your doubts now. Here I have given only the outline of the topics. That's all. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your clear explanation on distances in graphs. Okay, thank you, sister. So, so I think we can proceed with the vote of thanks, right, sir? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let okay. me now invite Dr. Jess Muller, Assistant Professor of Mathematics, to propose the vote of thanks. 
good morning to all i deem it a great honor to propose what of thanks on behalf of the department of mathematics holy cross college to our resource person dr titus head and assistant professor in mathematics university college of engineering nagarkoil sir you gave a wonderful session for us you gave a distance concept especially geo domination number vertex geo domination number d2 distance especially d its properties with the examples sir your presentation and explanation were highly motivated all of us to the field of distance in graph theory thank you very much sir for readily accepting our invitation thank you sir thank you thank you ma'am thank you my friends dear participants shortly we shall begin our technical session 2 we have with us dr andrew kinsley associate professor st xavier's autonomous college palengkote may i now invite mrs makila assistant professor and one of the organizing secretaries to introduce and welcome the resource person good morning to one and all gathered here it's my pleasure to welcome our resource person dr andrew kinsley associate professor department of mathematics st xavier's college autonomous palengkote here is his brief by data for our view dr andrew kinsley is at present an associate professor of mathematics he has completed his masters degree in mathematics from st xavier's college during the year 1982 and masters degree in technology from anonymous names in the nari university in the year 2011 He awarded his PhD in the year 2013. Apart from his academic positions and credibility, he has served in various administrative positions such as vice principal, for shift one, coordinator of Department of Mathematics Self Financed, and coordinator of Department of Visual Communication Self Financed. In total, he has got 32 years of teaching experience. His fields of interest are graph algorithms, flow networks, distance in graphs, central structures in graphs, and distance domination in graphs. He has published 32 research articles in various reputed international and national journals. By the way of intensive research, he is successfully guiding seven PhD scholars as guide. He also served as a convener of nine state level. national level international level conferences further he has completed two minor research projects funded by ugc he was awarded tamil nadu state best program officer award for the year 1994 95 i hope he is apt person for this webinar on distances and algorithms in graphs on behalf of the department of mathematics I accord you a cheerful welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. May I now hand over the session to Dr. Andrew Kent. Respected Dr. Sister Anne Perfect Sophie, Principal of Holy Cross College, Nagar Koil. Respected Dr. Sister Lima Rose, Vice Principal of the College. Dr. V. M. Arul Flower Mary, Convener and the Head of the Department of Mathematics. organizers dr jc mahila and his sister yes antin medi the faculty members of the department dear participants good morning to all i thank the organizers uh, for the chance to participate in your webinar as a research person today i am going to deliver a webinar lecture on graph algorithms and computing techniques okay i am going to explain about the graph algorithms it is just a introduction part and uh, computing techniques computing technique means uh, complexity analysis so here this uh, al graph algorithms algorithms graph algorithm has, has the contents like that algorithms complexity orders of magnitude analysis efficiency 
graph algorithms, types, linear algorithm, polynomial algorithm, exponential algorithm, and uh, NP complete algorithms, regressive approximation algorithms. First of all, I explain about this introductory part of algorithms. Next, I will explain the distant concepts using algorithm. Now, finally, I will explain about the geodetic sets and the geodomination like that. Here, the algorithm and the computational complexity. What is the algorithm? Algorithm is a finite sequence of instructions for performing an, an work or a computation for solving a problem. This is a finite sequence of, finite number, finite sequence of instructions, that's all, that is the algorithm. Then computation complexity means it, how, how long it works, the algorithm will work, how long, what's the time taken, like that. That is computational uh, time complexity, that measures the processing time and uh, computer memory record for, by the algorithm to solve problems of a particular problem size. Problem size means uh, regarding, uh, regarding the um, uh, graph, regarding any graph, we consider the size of the graph. Size of the graph means uh, number of vertices. Uh, that is the size of the graph. That, uh, that is the, uh, if you given, the, if you, if we give, if we give a graph, we can have a, uh, set of uh, vertices. The set of vertices the data structure. Then, why graph algorithms? Graphs are an ambiguous data structure in computer science. Uh, networks, uh, LAN, the internet, wireless networks, we use these graph algorithms. Relationship between objects, online dating, social networks, uh, feedback like that. Hundreds of interesting computation problems depend on graphs. Time complexity of an algorithm. The size of the problem is an integer n. The number of inverts. Number of invert means regarding the graph, we can consider the size of uh, vertex set n. We measure the complexity of an algorithm. The running time of an algorithm, that depends the size n. Therefore, we can denote this as a T of n. Orders of magnitude. For this purpose, complexity purpose, mainly we need these magnitudes, asymptotes. These are called asymptotes. That is big O. First one is big O. Normally we are using this big, big O. Uh, then big omega, then big theta, uh, there are three, there are five types of uh, orders of magnitudes, but we concentrate only, only three uh, orders of magnitudes. So that is big O, big omega, then theta, like that. Orders of uh, magnitude, big O, what is the meaning of big O? Big O, big O notation. The big O e will compare with the two types of functions, f of x and g of x. The relation between f of x and g of x is uh, mentioned as big O. When you say f of x is equal to big O of g of x, that is, uh, uh, if there exist two positive constants, uh, c and k, there are two functions, that is, uh, the functions are depending on uh, small x, x is the variable, then the two functions are, this is a normal case, the two functions are uh, equal, the related to uh, why, when, what is, a, uh, what is a circumstance. A function f of x is big O of g of x, if there exist two positive constants, c and k, such that f of x is less than or equal to c, uh, c g of x. Sometimes c may be equal to, uh, may be less than, uh, may be greater than zero, uh, that is uh, in between zero and one, that may be fractions. Uh, sometimes it may be a positive integer like that. Therefore, here, uh, positive constants f of e x is less than or equal to c of g of x. You can see this is uh, here f of x. Uh, uh, f of x uh, for every x belongs to k means there is a bound. Here, there is a bound k. Therefore, for this k, uh, 
uh, this uh, uh, for k means uh, when you consider this x uh, measuring along the x axis uh, here the x uh, comes to this place k therefore when k is greater than, greater than k uh, uh, x is greater than k then we define f of x we can calculate f of x and g of x therefore f of x is the uh, this is the straight line yes that is given in the uh, geometry then uh, g of x c into g of x is given uh, is another straight line you can say after x greater than k that g g of uh, c into g of x is greater than f of x the, then only we can say that this uh, f is related to gx with respect to capital o otherwise f of x is equal to capital o of g of x then here uh, c g of x we can see the examples after that big o notation here uh, f of x is equal to big o of g of x here also another example f of x this is a curve f of x then c g of x another straight line after the point k then f of x is greater than g greater than equal to c g of x where c is a constant therefore we can say that f of x is equal to b q of g of x then omega b q of omega here also uh, f of there are two functions f and g f of x and g of x we say that f of x is equal to b q of g of x if there are positive constants c and k such that uh, f of x is greater than or equal to c of g of x then this is just now uh, it is reversal uh, from the big o because uh, they are in big o f of x is less than equal to c g of x here f of x is greater than or equal to c g of x where c is also a positive constant x is also greater than k then only we can say that f of x is equal to big o of g of x be omega of g of x here another another com uh, computational magnitude uh, that is theta notation uh, here the f of x that is f of x curve is bounded by c1 of g of x c2 uh, c2 of c2 into g of x after x greater than after x uh, that is x greater than or equal to k after k therefore here we can say that in this figure c1 of g of x is uh, uh, and c2 of g of x the two straight lines uh, yes uh, cover this straight line f of x after x greater than equal to k then only we can say that f of x is theta uh, g of x therefore these are the three magnitudes uh, uh, asymptotes uh, then using these three asymptotes we can find out the complexity then other shapes uh, like that it is uh, l of x uh, logarithm of x uh, here it is a log x uh, curve another one is uh, square root x curve here also x curve x curve starts from uh, origin okay and then we can say that the is uh, uh, square, square root of x curve uh, uh, sorry log x curve is bounded by square root of x curve square root of x curve is bounded by x then here also we can we can fix this uh, big o magnitude uh, omega and uh, theta other shapes sublinear shapes polynomial that is x power k if uh, yes x power a if a is equal to 1 then we can say that it is linear if a is greater than 1 we can say that it is polynomial exponential means uh, x must be in the power therefore here there are uh, there are four types of curve 2 in the x x squared x in the log x x these are the curve, curves uh, next big o of r next uh, we we study about the particular uh, magnitude big o uh, for polynomials uh, there is a theorem f of x is equal to uh, polynomial uh, that is x power n a and x power n plus dash dash a a naught 
where a n a n minus one are real numbers it is a polynomial then we can say that f of x is big o of x power n because x power n is the leading leading term a n is the leading polynomial therefore when you, we can divide this uh, f of x as a power n if you divide this a power this rhs reckon said by a power a n we can have x power n plus a n minus 1 by a n like that okay then only we can say that it is a, a polynomial uh, of degree n and also divided by a n so it is uh, don't worry about this dividing this constant then only we can say that this f of x is big o of x n suppose f of x is equal to 2 into x power n plus something uh, then we can say that it is also big o of x power n suppose it is uh, 10 x power n plus uh, something uh, then we can say that it is also big o of uh, x power n then example x squared plus 5x we can say that it is big o of uh, x squared okay uh, we can forget this 5x also suppose it is 5x squared plus uh, x we can say that this big o, big o of x squared this is an example then now i come to this uh, complexity connecting the algorithm adding and it is a very simple uh, program adding a and b input integers a comma b okay add a, sum is equal to a plus b then output is sum it is a small algorithm adding just uh, two uh, integer type data a and b a plus b okay sum is equal to a plus b here a and b are given values. Sum is the variable. Sum is equal to a plus b. Then we can have the output sum. Now you see there is an only one operation plus works in one time. And so the complexity is big O of 1. Yes. Similarly, there are three inputs a comma b comma c. Sum is equal to a plus b plus c. Then Output uh, output is sum. There are two operations. Uh, there are only one operation. Yet it, uh, it, it is used in two times. Therefore, there are big O of two. We can say that the complexity is big O of two. Adding n number of integers, the complexity is big O of n minus one. Adding n number of integers means you can have uh, adding two. Uh, num uh, two uh, num uh, integers there exists plus only one plus is used you plus is used only one time similarly here two times three four uh, two times therefore here n number of integers then n minus one times uh, plus will work therefore the complexity is big o of n minus one we can say that this also big o of uh, n therefore these types of algorithms are Linear types algorithm. It is a very, very elementary uh, algorithm. Then algorithm. Addition and multiplication. Integers a comma b comma c. Sum is equal to uh, a star c plus b star c. There are uh, two uh, two operations. A star multiplication and a plus operations. But how many times they are used? Three times. And here one time plus is used. Two times a star a star that is a multiplication is used therefore we can say that uh, big o of three the computation is big o of three input integers a comma b comma c another one here also uh, two times plus operation and the star operations therefore complexity is big o of two multiplying n number of integers the complexity is big o of n minus one or big o of n here it is a quadratic how here uh, there, there are two there are two for loops one for loop is inside another one this for loop it will work at n times then the outer for loop will work n times the zero to n zero to n minus one therefore n times therefore uh, here the the total for loop the the nested for loop will work at n squared time Therefore, we can say that, uh, yes, a for loop means uh, inside of these for loops, uh, we can have some operations uh, like that, uh, interchanging, 
uh, or plus or minus or multiplication and uh, sometimes like that okay therefore uh, the co of n squared this uh, uh, this algorithm has two for loops therefore in a step for loop the uh, cost is b co of n squared because it is quadratic then factorial of n it is a linear type algorithm how it is linear factorial of n means if n is equal to 1 then fact is equal to 1 else fact is equal to n star n into fact n minus 1 this is a recursive algorithm it, yes because you can see n factorial is equal to n into n minus 1 factorial Therefore, factorial is defined itself. Therefore, we can say that it is a recursive algorithm. Recursive algorithm. It has a run time. How many times this uh, the star will work uh, n times? Therefore, this uh, n minus 1 times. Therefore, it is uh, big O of n minus 1 or big O of n. If uh, n has power 1, then we can say that this uh, complexity this running time is uh, linear. Interchanging. Interchanging means a swap A comma B. Here we are going to change A and B itself. Uh, B, B is substituted to A, A is substituted to B. That's all. Given uh, list 9 comma 6 comma 7 comma 8 comma 5, then I am going to interchange 5 and 9. Then it is a very very simple program it has three steps say eh? swap 9 comma 5 eh? yes that is swap 9 comma 5 means eh? interchange 9 and 5 take a is equal to 9 b is at 5 then first we put the another temporary variable temp is equal to a then only we can put the value for b to a uh, then uh, already we can assume the temp is equal to a now you substitute this uh, temp, temp, temp variable to b therefore the a and the variable a the variables uh, the values of a and b are interchange now the first given list uh, 9 6 7 8 5 now the list is uh, ordered list is in increasing order 5 comma 6 comma 7 comma 8 comma 9 then measuring the efficiency of uh, algorithms uh, we have two if we have two algorithms algorithm one and algorithm two uh, that is all the same problem our application needs a fast running time fast running time means uh, how do we choose between uh, the algorithms then what is the uh, fastest algorithm what is the efficient algorithm how do we choose it an algorithm's execution time is related to the number of operations it executes yes the previous uh, small problems uh, we have uh, studied about this execution of operations and algorithms executions time is related to the number of operations it executes then count the number of steps and operations the algorithm will perform for an input of a given size uh, number of steps uh, same uh, one problem uh, same input data Therefore, size is same. Then, how we how the algorithm one and the algorithm two uh, solve the same problem? Then, first of all, we must count the number of operations used and the number of steps used in the two different algorithm to solve the problem, same problem. Then, algorithm A requires n squared by two steps to solve a problem of size n. Algorithm B requires pi n plus 10 st steps to solve a problem of uh, size n. Steps, steps means uh, including the uh, uh, number of operations, including the operations uh, working in uh, how many times, uh, like that, number of times, uh, like that. That algorithm requires n squared by 2 steps to solve a problem. Similarly, the algorithm P requires pi n plus 10 steps to solve the same problem. Then which one would you choose? Now you see that because we are going to test the efficiency. When we increase the size of input n, how the execution time grows for these algorithms. Then if n is equal to uh, here, the, the two types of algorithm, 
n squared by 2 and 5n plus 10, then n is equal to 1, then n squared by 2 will give 5. Similarly, when n is increasing, you can see the last column, n is equal to 1 lakh. What happened to n squared by 2 and 5n plus 10? Here, this yeah, when n is equal to 1, uh, one lakh, the execution, you see this execution, it is, uh, this, this is million and million, we can see that. When we compare these two uh, rows, the n squared by 2 will require more time. I n plus uh, 10 will require uh, this less time, therefore, which is good the efficient algorithm pi n plus 10. Therefore, we can say that uh, algorithm A requires uh, n squared by 2. It is a worst case algorithm. Algorithm B requires uh, pi n plus 10. It is a efficient algorithm. Thus, uh, we can find out the efficiency of the algorithms. Here also, you can see the, that uh, figure is given here. Step uh, series 1. Series 1 is high, uh, series 1 and uh, series 2, you can see. This is, uh, uh, you can see in series 1, the, uh, the same number, uh, you can see x is equal to uh, 31. The size uh, n is equal to 31. You can see this uh, vertical line. This is more larger than the blue color series. Series 1 is larger than series 2. Therefore, this series 2 is the efficient algorithm. Like that, algorithm requires n squared by 2 operations to solve a problem of size n. Algorithm B requires phi n plus 10 operations to solve a problem of size n. For large enough uh, prob problem size, algorithm B is more efficient. Therefore, this is the result. Similarly, we focus on the growth rate. Algorithm A requires time pro proportional to n squared. Algorithm B requires time proportional to n. Therefore, B is better than A. Efficient algorithm, worst case efficiency and best case efficiency. Uh, worst case efficiency means is the maximum number of steps needed. Best case efficiency means minimum number of steps is needed. Therefore, yeah, best case and worst case. Here, NP complete problem. Uh, a problem is called NP complete. NP means non-deterministic polynomial. If its solution can be guessed and verified in polynomial time. Uh, polynomial time. Non-deterministic means that no particular rule is followed to make the guess. If a problem is NP and all other NP problems are prob polynomial time redu reducible to it, the problem is NP complete. Therefore, that is non-deterministic means there exists no rule uh, to uh, no rule to frame a algorithm. Therefore, the, that that may be polynomial that may not be polynomial. Therefore, this is a a case. It is a worst case analysis in uh, algorithm analysis. That is NB complete problem. Uh, many maximum number of uh, graph algorithms are NB complete problems. Here, slow sort algorithm. Procedure slow sort. Slow sort means uh, you can see this is slow sort as this. Uh, this is a working example. This uh, unsorted 23, 78, 45, 8. This is original list is given. Then here you, for the first sort, for the first sort means uh, 23 is chosen. 23 to 78 comparison. Therefore, compare, when we compare 23 and 78, uh, uh, so 20, 78 is great, uh, uh, greater than, that is greater than 23. We are going to sort this list in ascending order. Therefore, 23 and 72, there exists no change. Next, 23 will come and test this uh, 45. 45 is greater than 23, there exists no change. 23 and 8, eight are, uh, yes, uh, are checked. Uh, then 8 is lesser than 23. Therefore, 
using this swap analysis or swap algorithm, 8 is changed, interchanged to 23. First place, 23 is interchanged to 8, that is uh, fourth place. Therefore, after the uh, next one, 23 will go and check 32. There exists no change. Next, uh, uh, next what? Uh, 23 and 56. There is no change because 32 and 56 are uh, greater than 23. Therefore, 23 is kept in the fourth place. 8 is in the first place. This is uh, after pass 1. Okay. Therefore, this uh, testing with 23 is over. Next is 78 is ready to check this, uh, having a check with 45, 78 to 45, 78 to 23, like that. Next, listen, 23 will be, uh, 23 and 78 will be interchanged. 23 will come to this, uh, this first place, then 72 in the third place. Similarly, this swap program will interchange this, 78 and 23. Then after uh, pass 2, we can have this uh, 23 is here, second place, then 45, 78. Like that, similarly, at last, uh, we can have the, after the pass 5, we can have a sorted list in ascending order. That is given by, the, that can be done by the slow, by the sorting algorithm. Sorting algorithm, this is sorting algorithm. First, first one you take this uh, R is equal to 1, take this X1, then J is equal to uh, 1 plus 1, that is R equal to 1, 1 plus 1, 2, therefore X2 and X1 are checked. Yes, if X1 is greater than X2, then there is a swap, this swap will work. Therefore, it shows that it makes one comparison. Uh, we can have n into nc2, we can have nc2 number of uh, operations, here n minus operation means here comparison, less than, this less than is the comparison, this is the operation, how many times it will work, n minus, at the maximum, nc2 number of times, therefore n into, nc2 means n into n minus 1 by 2, okay, therefore the number of uh, comparison is, uh, uh, theta big theta of uh, n squared. Here it is n squared minus n by 2. The n squared, the higher term is, uh, all the other terms remaining, the higher term is omitted. Therefore, big theta of uh, n squared. Next, uh, it is easy to imagine that some of these lists are very long. Uh, here it is a very small list. Uh, and the replacement of big, uh, big theta of n squared by an average of uh, big uh, O of n log n comparison is very, uh, yes, very welcome. Very welcome means uh, we have seen this type of uh, n squared and n log n. Here it is uh, uh, x log x, that is n log n, it is n squared. Therefore, this is uh, n, uh, n log n is, uh, it is efficient than n squared. That is uh, given there. Here, listen. Uh, this uh, theta n squared, uh, here also big O of n log n. Finally, we can convert this theta n squared to big O of n squared by an average of this. Here it is, big O of n log n, it is, a, it is another uh, type of algorithm. Yes, it is linear sorting. Theta of n squared is uh, linear sorting. But we will study about this quick sorting algorithm. Quick sorting algorithm means uh, uh, it has a complexity big O of n log n. An insurance company that wants to alphabetize its list of uh, uh, policy holders uh, will gra gratefully notice the difference between n squared. This is a n. This is n is equal to five comma three zeros and three zeros five million. Okay, then our n squared is equal to this. But uh, n log n, taking log n and uh, multiply this n, we can have this type of uh, values comparisons. You can check this uh, twenty five and add 
and uh, 77 and odd, please check that uh, which is larger, n squared is larger. Therefore, this uh, linear sorting is, uh, is a worst case algorithm where the, we will study about this uh, type of algorithm that is a uh, quick sort algorithm in the S. Next, uh, quick sort algorithm is better than this linear sorting algorithm, quick sort algorithm. This is a quick sort algorithm. This, uh, now you can see this quick sort algorithm. Quick sort algorithm means uh, Uh, we consider this one, this unsorted, this. Uh, you, can, you can take this 8, otherwise uh, randomly we can choose uh, part, uh, 45 or 8 like that. Yes, you can uh, take this 8, choose this 8. Then consider this group. This group, uh, this group means, subgroup means 23, 78, 45. Here, uh, our aim is, we, can, we have to sort this 23, 78, 45. Next, we can sort another one, 32, 56. Uh, next, we choose 78 in this group, divide 23 and 45 like that. Therefore, the choosing algorithm means by randomly we can choose this uh, element, choose the elements, then grouping that left hand side and the right hand side. Then we can have the we can we can sort this algorithm quickly. That uh, uh, that example is not at given here. Using this algorithm, using this algorithm, we can find out uh, uh, we can find out the uh, ascending order list. Next, that's all. Elementary graph algorithms. Now we come to this uh, graph algorithms. Graph algorithm means uh, first of all representation of graphs. How do we represent these graphs? Here, uh, two standard ways, adjacency list. That is adjacent, uh, adjacency list for uh, sports, uh, sp sports graphs, adjacency matrix for uh, dense graphs. Normally, we are using dense graphs. Then adjacency matrix. Adjacency matrix, you know that, uh, uh, here, one, uh, it is a given, it is a small, small graph, uh, given graph, one, two, three, four, five, it is a small graph. Uh, here, one and two, adjacency means one and two are connected. How many times? Only one. But one and one, there exists no loop, therefore, there exists no loop, therefore, one and one is not connected. One and uh, one and two, uh, one and two are connected. How many times? One time. Therefore, as you can see, one and three is uh, not connected. One and three is connected. Therefore, one and uh, yes, in this row, you can see, yes, zero. Below three, we can see zero means uh, it is not connected. Therefore, thus we can find out the ascension adjacency matrix. Then, graph uh, traverse. Now, listen. Graph traverse means these are the uh, algorithms. Yes, uh, algorithms, this is old algorithms. We can see these algorithms in a, any algorithms book uh, for solving most problems on graphs. That is a graph traversals for this. First of all, we can go, we can visit vertices and edges like that. There are two major travel algorithms. That is BFS and DFS. They are standard algorithms. We can see these standard algorithms in any book. These are the algorithms. Here, the algorithms, uh, there are two types of uh, uh, algorithms. That is what big O of V. V means uh, number of vertices. Here, theta of E. E means, uh, suppose, uh, number of vertices is N, number of edges is small m then we can have theta of n and theta of uh, m like that. Then there are, uh, two, uh, when you add these two things, because uh, in this algorithm, there are two types of uh, components. First component, we need theta of v. Second component, uh, we need this theta of v. Then adding this theta of v and theta of v, then theta of v plus e. Therefore, this is the algorithm of complexity big theta of n plus m. 
minimum spanning tree you can have minimum we uh, you see uh, here spanning tree of a undirected gaps or spanning tree of a direct gap like that now it is an example laying telephone wire here so many houses and the central office uh, direct approach here we can connect uh, each uh, house to the central office uh, it is more expensive but here you can see this is a graph it is a tree then it is connected like that it is not uh, more expensive therefore it is a better approach like that uh, here uh, max uh, spanning tree uh, how we can generate a, a MST MST means minimum spanning tree in the previous example we can have the minimum spanning tree okay here it is uh, minimum spanning tree means uh, it is a graph given it is not a tree then uh, here the minimum spanning tree can be computer like this a to d then d to c like that uh, a to b therefore it is a minimum spanning tree for this minimum spanning tree we can have a pr prince algorithm just i introduce the algorithms that's all prince algorithm it will find out the minimum spanning tree then all spares uh, shortest parts uh, that uh, famous algorithms we know uh, distorts algorithm it will take big o of uh, n n plus m log n time you see this uh, uh, complexity therefore i am giving this example here uh, to analyze the complexities then floyd warshall algorithm this is another algorithm uh, to find the shortest pass between two vertices, shortest part between two vertices. Therefore, uh, here it is a uh, Floyd Orsal algorithm. Uh, we, we need big O of big, big O of V cube. But uh, it is distracts algorithm is better than this uh, Floyd Orsal algorithm. That this algorithm, what is the work of this algorithm? It will find uh, it will find the the shortest distance between two vertices. Then find a maximum independent set. Maximum independent set means here, uh, maximum independent set means a set of vertices is called independent. If no pair of vertices is connected, then we consider this uh, ADIH. ADIH means uh, here this A, uh, D, Okay, A, D, I, H. Uh, I, H. A, D, I, H is an independent set, but uh, it is wrong. It is not an independent set because these two I and H are connected. Uh, here, A, C, J, F, G. A, C, A, C, J, F, G. It is a, a maximal, it is an independent set. Then we can say it is a maximal independent set. Maximal means uh, the cardinality of the set of vertices is maximum. Then only we can say that it is a maximal independent set. Then what is our aim? We have to find the maximal independent set of this uh, graph, set of vertices of this graph. An independent set is called maximal if by including any other vertex not in I, uh, uh, not in I, the independence property is, is uh, violated. Suppose we add one, uh, one more vertex, it is not in the maximum, not in the independence set. We add this, if it is affected, if it is violated for independence property, then we can say that this is a maximal independence set. Here is a maximal independence set. Here is a problem when we are uh, we are going to find out the cardinality of maximal independent set. There is a connection between independence, maximal independent set and the, the dominating set. Domination number and maximum independent set number, we can have one connection. Here we see domination problem. Every maximal independent set is in a graph G is a minimal dominating set. Minimal dominating set, that is uh, uh, minimum of all minimal dominating set is, is called the, the number is called the uh, domination number. Therefore, here uh, we find our, here a uh, theorem, 
ఎవరి మాక్సిమల్ ఇండిపెండెన్స్ సెట్ ఇన్ ఏ గ్రాఫ్ జి ఇస్ ఏ మినిమల్ డామినేటింగ్ సెట్ ఆఫ్ జి దర్ ఫోర్ ద కార్డినాలిటీ ఆఫ్ ఏ మినిమమ్ డామినేట్ సెట్ ఇన్ ఏ గ్రాఫ్ ఇస్ ద డామినేషన్ నంబర్ ఆఫ్ ఏ గ్రాఫ్ దట్ ఈస్ ద డెఫినేషన్ ఫార్ డామినేషన్ నంబర్ using the algorithm to find the size of a maximal independent set we can design a 2 minus epsilon approximation algorithm we can say the approximation algorithm now i am going to uh, we are going i am going to discuss about this uh, approximation um, algorithm that is maximum independent set maximum independent set it is a very simple example c5 1 2 3 4 5 are vertices then you can see 1 and 3 1 and 3 1, 3 is a maximal independent set 5 and 2 2, 5 is a maximum independent set if you add one more vertex then it will not be a maximal independent set suppose 1 and 3 1, 3 is a maximal independent set you add 4 what happened then 4 and 3 are just sent therefore it will not be a maximal independent set so similarly you add 5 therefore 1 comma 3 is a maximal independent set 2 comma 4 is a maximal independent set 3 comma 5 is a maximal independent set like that therefore we can say that the cardinality of <coughs> maximal independent uh, set is cardinality of maximal independent set is 2 uh, how do you find this now i am going to use this algorithm first of all i delete 1 any 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 vertex therefore delete one we can have a path that is a polynomial 2 3 4 5 it is in the left hand side you put this in the left hand side next you delete we delete the neighborhood of one uh, arbitrarily we have chosen one now we delete uh, the neighborhood of one therefore 3 and 2 and 5 here delete 2 and 5 from this uh, car we can have a single uh, edge 3 3 and 4 next uh, it is now i am going to use this recursive algorithm next you choose this in the place of this c5 uh, we can have a polynomial p4 okay next i delete 2 arbitrarily i choose this 2 yes okay then we can have uh, delete this 3 4 5 next one uh, uh, we delete the neighborhood of 2 also therefore here we delete the neighborhood of 2 also that is 3 we can have 4 and 5 uh, this another edge in the right hand side you see in the right hand side 3 comma 3 and 4 it is a p2 therefore now we delete 3 we have a singleton vertex therefore yeah then you delete this neighborhood we can have pi in the in this side we can have pi therefore uh, here uh, a left hand side another part here the left hand side we can have this car then this also is split into two cars left and right here this also split into right hand side also split into uh, two cars like that finally here it is uh, now uh, final in the left hand side we can see this final that is five five only now uh, here also you can see in this uh, in this uh, place zero because zero element zero element is five uh, yes we will go to the algorithm now yes maximum set one algorithm name is uh, maximum one set one return the size of largest independent therefore what is our aim to find the size of the largest independent set of uh, uh, maximal independent set of it is of g if g has no edges suppose there exists no edges no edges means say uh, uh, one two three four five no edges what is the maximal independent set all the vertices the one two three four five therefore this size is the cardinality equal to 5 and therefore we can say the cardinality is equal to 1 oh. if g has no edges maximum maximum set 1 is equal to the whole uh, vertex set cardinality therefore else 
suppose uh, there exists uh, uh, vertices having edges, then else means there exists vertices having edges. The, uh, then we can choose some uh, non isolated vertices V star of G. Uh, uh, delete this, we uh, choose some non isolated vertices V star. Uh, here also in this graph, in this graph, the, uh, there are uh, five edges. Therefore, the first uh, obvious case is not uh, satisfied. Then we can choose some non-isolator vertex set. Like here we choose this one like that. That is given in the algorithm. Choose this V star. V star is equal to one. Therefore, max set one G minus V star G G minus one the vertex one, then we can have, uh, we can have this uh, two, three, four, five, like that. Therefore, similarly, uh, the last, uh, okay, here, what is the definition of uh, N, N1? Definition of N1 means uh, G minus V star, find the maximum, maximum set one, therefore, uh, coordinate of maximal uh, independent set, largest independent set, is uh, G minus V star that you put this is as N1. Then neighborhood in the right hand side, you can see the, this is has the uh, same, we are applying the same algorithm. We can have the um, uh, N2 values. Therefore, left hand side N1, right hand side N2. Oh, N1 and N2. Then find out this uh, maximum. Uh, uh, maximum of n1, then n2 plus 1. Here in this uh, in this program, the finally we will have this uh, n1 is equal to n1 is equal to uh, is equal to finally means uh, here it is. We can take this this only because here n1 is equal to n2 is equal to zero. N, N1 is equal to N2 is equal to 0. Here it is also, uh, here it is uh, N1 is equal to 1, N2 is equal to 0. Then finally, in, uh, uh, applying this program, uh, this algorithm, we can have N1 is equal to 2, N2 is equal to 1, 1 plus 1. Otherwise, N2 is equal to 0, then 1 plus 0. What is the maximum value? Maximum of N2 comma 1 is N2. Therefore, in this uh, uh, C5, we can have this uh, cardinality of maximum independence it is uh, uh, maximum independence it is two. Similarly, uh, this is the uh, complexity result. Complexity result means uh, we use this uh, uh, recurrence relation. After this recurrence relation, we have this. Uh, Xn is equal to big, uh, big O of C plus epsilon power N. Finally, we will have Fn is equal to big O of 1.619 N. Normally, when uh, no, uh, normal, normally we can have the complexity of this algorithm is Fn is equal to big O of 2 power N. Big O now, big O of 2 power N, normal case. Uh, that is worst case algorithm, we can have this. Here, this algorithm, uh, choosing this uh, one vertex arbitrarily, then deleting it, then uh, next, uh, next one is in the right hand side, uh, delete this neighborhood also, I like that. We can have Fn is equal to the Q of 1.619 power n. Then, Next uh, max set algorithm, this is a second algorithm uh, using, uh, using this, choose a vertex V star of degree greater than or equal to 2. There is a change from that algorithm and the maximum set to 1 algorithm and the max set to 2 algorithm. There is a change. Then after that, uh, using the same uh, recurrence relation and uh, finding this, we can have uh, zero, uh, 0 point so one point, big O of 1.47 power n. Yes. Now listen, the previous one has cardinality. Uh, previous one has the complexity. Big O of 1.619 uh, 1 power 9. 
here it is uh, big o of 1.47 power n the worst case is uh, uh, a very very simple algorithm uh, we can find this nice uh, set worst case is big o of 2 power n big o of 2 power n 2 power n therefore the complexity is reduced from 2 power n to 1.619 power n and 1.47 power n like that finally 1.39 uh, 1.39 power n also can be obtained yes, it is regarding the uh, regarding the data data input data input means regarding the graph it is a very big graph we can go to this also big o of 1 plus 1.39 power n therefore we can say that the complexity is approximated to big o of 2 power n to big o of 1.39 this 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 is called this algorithm is called this running time is reduced from 2 power n to 1.3 power 3 1.39 n this is a reduced algorithm this is called approximated algorithm uh, this is the complexity is approximation therefore approximated algorithm is this uh, we can say that this one point one point you see this 1.619 power n that is 2 minus something some very uh, very small number that it be that may be epsilon therefore this big o of 1.619 Uh, power n can be set uh, can be called as big o of two uh, minus epsilon. Therefore, this case can be rewritten as two minus epsilon approximation algorithm, where epsilon is between zero and one. In many algorithmic uh, articles, we can say that we can see one plus epsilon approximation algorithm or two minus epsilon approximation algorithm. This is the case. then domination problem every maximal independent set in a graph g is a minimal dominating set of g this is a result uh, relating the independent set and the dominating set cardinality of a minimal dominant set in a graph is a domination number then we can say that uh, yes still now the uh, algorithm for finding uh, uh, finding the My, uh, finding the domination number is uh, nb complete understand now here we can say that this can be reduced uh, using the maximal independent set algorithm this uh, uh, domination number can be found using 2 minus epsilon approximation algorithm it is a very very important thing next distance in graphs okay we can design various types of algorithms for Uh, uh, central uh, structures like center, median, centroid, central path, or like that. We can design various types of algorithm for the above central structures using detour distance. Detour distance means uh, detour center, detour median, detour centroid, detour central path, like that. But uh, the these types of uh, uh, central structure using this detour distance. I have not yet studied. Therefore, researchers can uh, study this type of uh, detour distance. Uh, then, uh, study, uh, framing some results about uh, detour center, detour median, detour center, like that. Uh, then, framing algorithm for uh, the detour concepts uh, in uh, central concepts uh, using detour distance. Similarly, we can design various types of algorithm for the above central structures using monohonic distance. the references uh, chart trend it is a very good uh, book uh, chart trend and uh, uh, applied and algorithmic graph theory next one is wilf wilf is very it is a very standard book uh, hs wilf algorithms and uh, complexity mm, yes here it is a very good book for domination and the central concepts that is uh, uh, the third one is a very good uh, book uh, because Peter J. Slater is originated the central concepts using the two distance. I have so many uh, material to display, but uh, because of time, I want to finish this. 
I prepared for this geodetic concepts in graphs like that. Any researchers or any students can approach me using this. Uh, this is my uh, mail address, andrewkinsley at yahoo.com. This is my mobile, 944-346-496. Anybody can approach me, uh, then I will help you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, for explaining the procedures of computing algorithms with ease and expertise. Dear participants, you are now free to raise your questions and clarify your doubts. Remember to submit your feedback form, which will be posted shortly in Meet as well as in YouTube to receive your e-certificate. I thank all participants and all organizers patiently listening my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We now invite Dr. Sujin Pla, Assistant Professor, to propose the formal vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Gratitude is when a memory is stored in the heart and not in the mind. Moving on to the close of the session, I take privilege in thanking each one of you who actively participated in this webinar. First and foremost, I thank the Lord Almighty for the successful conduct of this session. With due respect, I record my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Sister Gerardine Jayam, the secretary, Dr. Sister Annie Perford Sophie, the principal, Dr. Sister Lima Rose, the vice principal, and Dr. Vinolia Jospin, the controller of examinations, for the sincere efforts they have been taking and rendering their support in all the activities of college. I extend a sincere and warm gratitude to you all, dear sisters and dear mom. Next, I express my sincere thanks to the resource person of this session, Dr. Andrew Kingsley, Associate Professor of St. Xavier's College, Kolem Kote. He has given us an in-depth idea on graph algorithms and computing techniques with utmost clarity. I hope it would be very useful for researchers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I would also like to convey my sincere thanks to Dr. Titus for his intellectual talk on the distance in graphs. And with a heart brimming with gratitude, I thank Dr. Arulflor Mary, the head of the department, organizers of this webinar, Sister Antin Mary and Ms. Mahila, and all the faculty of the PG and Research Department of Mathematics, Holy Cross College, for their scholarly suggestions and support for the successful conduct of this webinar. And dear participants, I thank each one of you for your active engagement throughout the session. To plan a garden is to believe in tomorrow. Let's log out of today's session with the hope that we will meet again shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Anandal. Life is a math equation. In order to gain the most, you have to know how to convert negatives into positives, says an unknown author. This marks the end of the webinar. At the end, I would like to thank everybody for being there with us. Your participation is highly appreciated. You shall receive a participation certificate once you submit the feedback form. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, sirs. Thank you.